Hey, hey, my name is Megan Blake. Welcome to my channel. Welcome to the Wife Series. That's what we are focusing on and will continue to focus on. So if you know anything about me or if you're new, I love coffee. All things coffee, cups, coffee cups, espresso, making lattes. I have a espresso machine. I'm about to buy a new coffee maker, not because I need one, but because I love all forms of coffee. If it's French press, ground, whatever it is, it's for me. Um, so uh, welcome to my channel. Welcome to the Wife Series. I do have a bit of a different perspective. So uh, I want to read to you a letter I wrote. Uh, and so we're going to title this entire thing for the woman who lost her husband. Um, losing can be defined in so many different ways and uh, for, unfortunately for me it was in terms of a divorce so I'm going to read to you a little bit about me before we get started on today's series I was married for almost five years and from that marriage I gained two beautiful daughters I was the one who fought for divorce and ultimately made the difficult decision to walk away of course, per scripture, we are all aware God hates divorce. This was not my original motive when I entered into separation. However, after gathering more and more information, I did have biblical grounds to ultimately make that choice as well as going where peace was. It was much more extensive than that one sentence, but nevertheless, it was a de decision that was not emotional or spiteful. Rather, it was a decision rooted in confidence with the Lord and hearing him through it all above myself or the enemy. Uh, I'm going to be sharing stories from my personal testimony, but more importantly, um, I'm going to be highlighting what God has done in my heart and the lessons I learned from my entire journey and the entire process. The woman who lost her husband is further identified as the woman who lost her husband to divorce, abandonment, infidelity, or even death. My heart is to try and be a voice of reason in that loss and not only give you scriptural knowledge but practical tools to take the steps towards freedom. Oftentimes in this type of pain we want God to remove us from it but have you ever thought that he might want to build us in it? So often we as humans do not respond to anything but pain. Pain is the only time here on earth where we do get to praise God, right? Through pain. When we get to heaven, we're not going to have that. So we get to, here on earth, praise God through our pain. Pain might just be the very thing that illuminates what we're called to. I have been seeing 9-11 every time I look at the clock. I was born September 11th. God has amazing ways of uniquely speaking to his sons and daughters. So I say to you, daughter, perhaps this is the time in which you have been created. Esther 4.14 Marriage is the highest calling. It is the union here on earth that symbolizes Christ and his bride. This is why the enemy attacks marriage so fervently, seeking to destroy any remnants of God in that relationship. I heard a quote once, hope is the melody of the future, but faith is dancing to it today. That is the perfect nugget to take with you. If you take anything from these videos, hope for what is to come. And today, stand in faith that God will shift your natural into a beautiful melody. So that's just a little intro about me and what my heart is in regards to these videos. And hopefully we can together uh, walk this journey of restoration, walk this journey of redemption through whatever loss you have faced or whatever loss you are facing. So I felt led to read about the Samaritan woman if you know that story at all, um, it's a beautiful, beautiful depiction of who Jesus is. And I want to share that with you today. So if you haven't heard it, hopefully this will tune your ears to what God is wanting to speak to you on the other side of this phone today, okay? First, let's get a sip of our coffee. All right. Jesus talks with the Samaritan woman. <clears throat> He had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of the ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. Sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, 
Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? The Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself? As did also his sons and livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become and then a, a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw more water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. She said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You're right when you say you have no husband. In fact, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that this is the place where we must worship it or is in Jerusalem. Excuse me, struggling to speak. <laughs> woman, Jesus said, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father uh, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father speaks, seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ. He's coming. And when he does come, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? So what I want to highlight of this story, there's a few things. First of all, this Samaritan woman, she's ashamed. She has encountered so much sin. She has walked through sin. She has been through so much and put herself through so much that nobody in her town wants to associate themselves with her. And she finds herself isolated. She finds herself in a place of, of just complete sorrow with those types of decisions and those things that she's done. I wonder how often any of us have gone through that, where we have made sinful choices, we've lived those choices out, and yet we're feeling so alone where sin almost has that expiration date, where it no longer is as satisfying as it once was, where it's no longer as fulfilling as it once was. And we come to a place to where we're realizing, wow, sin is no longer fun. Sin is no longer something I once saw as enticing, but rather it's caused me great turmoil. It's caused me to feel isolated and alone. And so this is the place in which the Samaritan woman had found herself in. Notice it said she went to go draw the water at noon. I want to point that out as well. Back in those days when they would draw water, they would go in the morning before it would be too hot, right? When we wake up at 6, 7, and we walk outside knowing the forecast says it's going to be 80 degrees that day or 90 degrees, if we get there early, early in the morning, it's not super hot, right? And that's what would happen. These women would go draw their water early in the morning before it was unbearable. But this Samaritan woman would draw her water in the middle of the day so that she would not have to encounter the recurring shame she was feeling inwardly. But in scripture, it even says in other versions that Jesus went to the well to wait for her. I love that. He he found himself at a place where he said, I'm not going to meet her there. I'm not going to get there once she's already there. I'm going to go and wait for her. And that's the God we serve. He's a, he's a wonderful father, a great father, and it, he gives us that choice. He gives us the choice to say, 
you know, I'm going to choose you because I want to choose you. And he waits patiently like a gentleman. He says, I'm going to sit back and I'm going to wait. I'm going to find my pl place, find myself in a place of waiting for my son or my daughter to, to come home and to say yes to me. And so until they do that, I'm just going to wait and I'm going to wait patiently. I'm not going to force anything on them. I'm not going to make them make this choice. I'm going to wait for them to understand this is the right choice. This is the best choice. This is a good choice. And this choice is going to help propel their life into better choices here on. It's going to propel, propel their life into peace, into joy, into hope. And so um, I just love that he goes and he waits for her. I also want to point out the end of the story. She says, uh, leaving her buckets of water, she drops the buckets of water and she runs back to the town, the town that she was so ashamed in, the, the town that she isolated herself in. She runs to that place and says, come and hear about everything. This man told me everything I ever did. Think about that statement. Like whenever you have close friends, okay, I've got some great best friends and they know some dark secrets of mine that I'm like, please do not tell anybody. <laughs> um, my initial thought is I really hope they do not defriend me or, you know, do the old saying, if they defriend you on Facebook, they're not your real friend, goodness. But anyways, I really hope they do not find themselves in a place of saying, mm, Megan has done too much. I do not want to be friends with her, you know? You have this area whenever you're vulnerable with people of wondering, are they gonna actually continue to love me or are they gonna see me differently? Are they gonna judge me for this? You know, and, and that's, that's a normal human thought to think, right? However, in this scenario, Jesus told her everything she'd ever done. And yet, instead of her feeling guilty or shame or wanting to hide away or go back and isolate herself, she was transformed in that moment Jesus transformed her heart by covering what she uncovered. He uncovered the facts of her life, but then he covered it with his grace. He covered it with his mercy and his goodness. And so that is the God we serve. That's the father we have. And so if, if um, your idea of a father has been tainted by your physical father here on earth, however, you can do that however you can try to do that wipe that slate clean in terms of our heavenly father it doesn't hold a candle to our our physical father while we all have a father and whether that means that father is non-existent that father has passed on that father has abandoned us or that father is present and loving whatever your physical version of a father is clean slate clean slate because we have a wonderful father in heaven and his name is Jesus and God and we are so blessed with that. And so the way this pertains to wife, the wife series, um, the Samaritan woman, she was a wife five times. She well knew what it was like to be a wife. Um, however, her decisions in those marriages and the way she went about being a wife was perhaps not the ultimate divine will of God. And so you that's listening to me, whether you are still in a marriage, whether your husband has passed away, whether you are divorced or in a separation, whatever status you find yourself in, I want to this original, this initial video to just be about first Jesus loves you and he sees you. Secondly, the isolation and the lingering loneliness that you're feeling, it does not last forever. This is a time, this is a season, and seasons do come and they do go. However, in the Bible, it even says we will have suffering. We will endure loss. We will understand the sting of death. We will know what, the, what suffering looks like, what pain looks like. But the biggest thing that we have to gather is that we don't have to walk those things alone. We have the ability to walk them with the one who created us. And then also we can walk those things uh, having accountability, having people around us in our circle praying for us and being there with us. 
And so uh, I just want this to resonate with you at home and just know that you're not alone in suffering. You're not alone as a wife who feels so isolated. You're not alone as a woman and uh, loss is real. Loss is, unfortunately, it's uh, very prevalent. But in that loss, we have a maker and we have our creator who is with us and holding our hand. So I'd like to pray for you today. And also thank you for joining and for being a part of this community that we're building uh, in the Wife series. And my heart is to help you and my heart is to walk with you as you journey this very difficult road of being a wife who's felt lonely, being a wife who hasn't felt seen, uh, I just want to be here for you and be a sounding board as we navigate this together, okay? So I'm going to pray real quick. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for the woman on the other side of this, for those that are listening and that are hurting in this very moment. I ask that your Holy Spirit just encompasses them right now and that peace surrounds them and that they know if anything that they take from this, that they know that they are so loved by their creator. And not, not only are they loved, but they're seen. And all those prayers that they've been praying or all the prayers that they're going to continue or start to pray, excuse me, that it's not falling on deaf ears, but rather it's doing something. And so God, we ask that as we journey this together, that they know they have a maker and they have a, a father in you. There's a scripture that literally says in Isaiah, I believe that my father, my God, my creator, he is my husband. And that's not weird. Don't make it weird. But it's, it's awesome. It's saying that when I don't feel seen, when I don't feel heard, when I don't feel understood, I have a father that sees all of that and knows all of that and understands all of that. And so I can go to him in those times. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you so much for being here. And I pray that we begin to have a heart that's willing to run to you as opposed to away from you in sin, a heart that's willing to run to you when we feel lost and alone because we know you're the only thing that's gonna satisfy and quench that thirst. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Be blessed and we'll see you for episode two.